Walking in this morning, and somebody said, well, are you preaching today? And I said, yes, and I went on, and I, I could have swore I heard them say, bummer. I'm not sure. <laughs> I, I, I just don't know. I think I'm working myself out of a job here with, between Jake and Janessa and the team. But anyway, isn't it great to be in a place where there's healthy, life-giving ministry every single week? Amen, everybody. Let's give our Lord and Savior a good hand clap. Could we do that? Amen. Well, we are on part number four of a series we're calling Capacity, and we planned the message Capacity right in the middle of what we call our Legacy Month. I'll talk a little bit more about that in the message. And when it, we've been trying to accomplish two things in this series. We've been uh, trying to accomplish one, challenging each one of us to consider our own individual capacity. And I've come to the conclusion in this series, and might be why I wrote the series before I even got to it, that there's still more inside of me. There's still room in me for God to move. In other words, I still have a lot of capacity to fill up. And I don't know if anybody else feels that way, but I feel convicted that there's more things. And, and we don't try to stress all the things we do here, uh, but at the same time, how many know there's some things to be done. Amen, everybody? And I want to reach capacity. So we're trying to accomplish as each one of us, you know, just being challenged in our own personal capacity in our lives. But then we're also kind of uh, speaking to us as a church, as a, as a corporate body, or if I could, just a big family. And the question that we have to ask as a church, are we as a church, are we filling the capacity that God has for us as a church? And I think the answer to that is also no. Even though we've done a lot, I think there's a lot of room in my humble opinion, we've just got started, everybody. We've just been building the foundation. And so today, as I get ready to dive into part number four, today's message is a little bit different. Today's message would be kind of one of those if we were just sitting in a small group that I'd like to talk to you about. Uh, it, it's really a pastor and a church uh, message more than just the individual. I want us all as a church body to evaluate where we're at with the subject of capacity. And uh, so that's what we're going to dive into. I don't know if you heard, but we had some elections last week. Did anybody know this? And, uh, and, and uh, we have a new president elect. How many know that, right, everybody? And uh, look, everybody's nervous that I'm getting ready to start talking about politics. Uh, well, we have a new president, but aren't you glad even bigger than that, we have the same God, right, everybody? Come on. We're part of his kingdom. Amen. One more time before I pray, I just think we ought to set our notes down and just be reminded that today is all about Jesus. No matter what you've come out of, no matter what you're going to face tomorrow, for the next few moments, set it all aside. God has something for us, and I believe that every person is here on purpose because he has something for us to do as a church. And let's give our Lord and Savior a good hand clap. Come on, everybody. Can we do that? Amen. Amen. Well, I mentioned the elections because I believe this is a time for us as people of God to be praying for our nation. Yeah. Yeah. Come on, how many know we live in such a divided time? And so we should be praying for our nation and we should be praying for president-elect and all that is surrounding that. Without me going into it, if you follow the news, you just know that uh, our nation needs prayer. Right, right everybody? And, uh, and if we as Christians aren't doing it, then who is? And so I just would encourage you to do that. So let's pray. Let's see what God has for us in this kind of corporate style message today. So, Father, in the next few moments, uh, I, I just feel like I just really need your heart. And I really need your voice right now, Lord. Uh, uh, Lord, I know you're going to speak to us as individuals. But I pray as a church, though you've blessed us so much, I pray that you would help us to see a bigger vision that, God, you are a big God, and we can dream big dreams, and you can accomplish great things through people that are willing. I pray that you would allow Radius to be part of the solution to this community we live in. In Jesus' wonderful name, amen and amen. How many have ever heard the name Ann Rice? Does anybody know who Ann Rice is? All right. Those are mostly the people that have their hands up are scary movie fans. All right. Uh, maybe, maybe not, maybe not. Ann Rice, uh, Ann Rice, she grew up in a pastor's home, which I find her story very fascinating because she grew up in a pastor's home. But then when she got to the age of 18, because of church hurt and things that were going on in the church world, she left the Christian faith. 
Now, as a pastor, I'm always interested in these kind of stories, but hers is a little bit more intriguing to me because as she left the Christian faith at 18 years old, she went on to write over 30 different books, and uh, she published over 90 million books. How many know that's a pretty good, uh, pretty good little body of work, right? Uh, some they made into movies. One uh, you've probably heard of, Interview with the Vampire. You know, the good Christian movie. You know what one I'm talking about there. And uh, anyway, she wrote that movie. It became a movie. And then, now watch this. So at 18, she left the Christian faith. And then in her late 50s, which would have been around 1998-ish, she came back to faith. Which, it's like the story of the prodigal. It's, it's kind of fascinating. She left because of church hurt. But then as she searched the world and had all this success, she realized the world couldn't fill her up either. So she came back to faith. And when she was back in faith, she wrote a trilogy of the life of Christ. And they made one of those into a movie also, uh, The Young Messiah. Maybe some of you uh, have seen that by Anne Rice. Then, here's where the story really intrigues me. Because she grew up in a pastor's home, she left faith, came back to faith, and then in July of 2010, she left the church again. This intrigues me. And as a pastor of people, and as a pastor that cares about people that have been hurt by the church and hurt by Christians, I'm intrigued that how could you leave, come back, knowing there was nothing out there, but then leave again, which means what was going on in here. And so in July of 2010, she stopped being a Christian. And matter of fact, on her Facebook page, she made a declaration, and I took it word for word, and I want to read it to you this morning. Here's what she posted, July 2010. For those who care, and I understand if you don't, today I quit being a Christian. I'm out. I remain committed to Christ as always, but not to being a Christian or to being a part of Christianity. This is such a large part of our world. We need to sit up and pay attention to this, whether we agree with her or not. It's simply impossible for me to belong to this quarrelsome, hostile, disputatious, and deservedly infamous group. For 10 years, I've tried, and I've failed. I'm an outsider. My conscience will allow nothing else. It goes on, and it says, My faith in Christ is central to my life. That's great. My conversion from a pessimistic atheist lost in a world I didn't understand to an optimistic believer in a universe created and uh, sustained by a loving God is crucial to me. That's good. But following Christ does not mean following his followers. Boy, that'll preach right there. And how many know that sometimes that's the problem with Christianity? It's not the God we follow. It's those that we think should be more than they are. And we forget that we're all imperfect people on a journey. Right, everybody? Come on. Christ is infinitely more important than Christianity and always will be no matter what Christianity is, has been, or might become. Wow. She said a lot right there, right? You say, well, Ken, how in the world does that have anything to do with the subject of capacity? Well, sometimes the church, I think, Sometimes, I've been in church all my life. Some of you have been hurt by church. Many people I talk to all the time have been hurt by church. They've left church. Radius has been their lifesaver where you've come back to church. Some a little bit timid. Some licking their wounds. But sometimes the church, would you agree with me? The church makes it challenging to reach our capacity because rather than building bridges, often our actions are creating bridges. Mm. You see, we're called to build bridges to people that don't look like us, that don't act like us, that don't think like us. Here it comes. You know it's coming. That don't vote like us. Yeah. And to those people that probably the people that get on our nerves the most are the people that need a bridge built to them the most. Well, I got three people that are glad they came today. 
And rather than building the bridge, we are called to be bridge builders, but rather, if you talk to the world outside the church, you will more often hear stories of not a bridge that was built to them, but a breach that was created to them. Ah. Mm. A breach. Uh, uh, I want to use the more formal definition. A breach is a, a failure to do what is required by law. Okay, that's the, the legal term. But I want you to see this next little part. A breach, uh, uh, something, a failure to do what is required by law, agreement, or duty. Uh-huh. We don't talk a lot anymore about Christian duty. Matter of fact, we, uh, in fact, I'm guilty because I've come so far from trying to tell everybody, look, this is a message of grace. It's not about what you do. It's about what he's done. And all that is true. But at the same time, we're not saved by works. But ladies and gentlemen, we are saved to do some works. And if we don't get that, we will never reach our capacity. Mm-hmm. He, 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 he saved us not by our works, but he saved us so that we could be some works. In other words, so that we could be his hands and feet. If that was not his desire, then we would drown you at water baptism service. <laughs> But we don't do that because God allows us to be his mouth, his hands, his feet. He allow- I've never seen God show up to adopt the block, but he sends us. Uh-huh. Come on now. All right. I told you it was a corporate message. Come on now. Uh, a, a breach in a contract means that someone didn't uphold their end of the bargain. I know we don't talk about that a lot, but there, we, we enter into a relationship with Christ. And how many know every good relationship has taking and giving? If one is always taking and never giving, then the relationship is bankrupt. And, and, and so just my unspoken contract, I, I don't know, when I, when I think about a duty that I have or a contract perhaps that I've made with Christ, uh, I, I think about it this way in real simple terms. He forgives us, so the contract ought to be that we forgive others. That sounds like a reasonable contract. I think I could find some scripture verses that would support that. And, and the contract would say, if he loves us, then we ought to go and come on. Yeah, and if, and if he gives grace to us, then we ought to go out and... Come on, everybody now. If he blesses us, maybe our blessing is not for us only, but maybe he blesses us so we can go and be a... Yeah, come on. There's a contract. And the question becomes, if we're ever going to reach capacity, we've got to bridge the breach in the contract. <laughs> Let me say how Isaiah said it. I'm going to go to this ancient text called the King James Version. Have any of you ever heard of this? All right. Amen. Here's what King James says. uh, Isaiah says, uh, it says, and they, they being the people of God, lean into this verse. I know there's some these and thous in it, but lean into it. And they that shall be of thee, they that shall be of thee. The church that ought to be a part of God, okay, uh, shall build the old waste places. In other words, we ought to be builders of the places that are now looked upon as waste. The places that have been rejected, the people that have been thrown away, the people that have been cast aside. Come on, somebody's going to have to help me today. It's about all of us in the family. And they that shall be of thee shall build the old waste places. Thou shalt raise up the foundations of many generations. And thou shalt be called the repairers of the breach. That's what we're supposed to be called. Because there's a breach. And sometimes we've created the breach. We know that sin created the breach. But, but sometimes the church, uh, instead of being bridge builders, has been breach makers. And so we that are of he ought to be called, come on everybody, repairers of the breach. Yeah, I'm talking to Radius today. I'm talking to us as a church. So let me say it another way. Radius Church, we have to be known. If we're going to reach capacity, we've got to be known. Not as a Sunday morning gathering. Not as a kumbaya club. Not as a holy huddle. But some people that are repairers of the breach. Come on, everybody. And we desperately need that. 
We just, you just drive through our little tulip town just, just, just once the sun goes down, and you will desperately see that we need repairs of the breach. Watch a YouTube channel on, on the elections, and you will see that we need some repairs of the breach. We need some people that will rebuild the bridges that have been destroyed, and that is our ultimate goal. It's our ultimate vision for Radius Church is that we together would be repairs of the breach, not sitting in the blessings of God, thanking God that we're not like all of them. Is this too tough for a Sunday morning? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But repairs of the breach. And, and we'll never reach capacity until we're repairs of the breach. And, and let me say it another way. Until we're part of the solution to the very things that irritate us and get under our skin about what's wrong with the community, the society, the government, the workplace, the world that we live in. Mm, repairs of the breach. Like Nehemiah. Nehemiah is another Old Testament figure who is literally a repair of the breach. He was taken in, into captivity, into Babylonian activity, or captivity, and then later uh, there was an exile. They were released, and, and, but they discovered that the walls of Jerusalem had been torn down. The walls of their city had been torn down. Nehemiah was a repair of the breach, and he went back and he rebuilt the walls of his home. Homeland. And I want to use him not to preach uh, verse by verse, but just as a backdrop, because Nehemiah gives me a picture of who I want us to be and who I want us to be known as a church, that he's seen a need and he filled it. Yeah. He found a hurt and he healed it. Yeah. Nehemiah. So I want to pull out a few things, because if we're going to reach our capacity, we're going to need to act a little bit like Nehemiah. And, and, and I, I'm going to give you a few things here. Number one, the first thing about Nehemiah, he acted with concern. If we're going to reach our capacity, there's got to be some level of concern in us for the things, watch this now, that concern God. We can no longer sit back at 5 o'clock and watch the evening news and say, shame on those people on the news for doing those things they're doing. Because if it had not been for the grace of God, uh, okay, let's get quiet. I'll get down in your business now. Hey, hey, listen, if, I, if grace hadn't have showed up in my life as soon as it did, I would have been the person on the 5 o'clock news. Uh, the very person that I can point at and criticize and say, how could they do that? I would probably do that to the 10th degree. Can anybody agree with me on that? If it had not been for God, it, 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 if, if sin had incubated in the oven of your life long enough, you'd be surprised what you could do. Mm -hmm. and, and so uh, Nehemiah, he acted with concern. We have got to be people that don't sit in our piety looking down at a broken world, but we've got to be concerned with what concerns God. Now, I have a confession to make. I admit to you I'm not always concerned with the things that concern God. In fact, sometimes I'm irritated by the things that concern God. You're a quiet group today. I don't know what's up. Uh -huh. so, so, you, you look at me like you don't know what I'm talking about. I've been irritated by people that God loves. <laughs> you guys must not watch YouTube enough is all I'm saying. Huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and so in this series, I've been praying, God, please concern me. Let me say it another way. God, would you break my heart with the things that break your heart? Because if the things that break your heart don't break my heart, then I'm disqualified to do what you've called me to do. Mm, 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 mm. Nehemiah was concerned for God's people. He was concerned that they were out there living with no protection. And matter of fact, literally, there were people that were homeless that were the people of God, and it concerned him. He was concerned enough to do some things. Number one, this is some points within a point, all right? Number one is that he was concerned enough to give. And, and don't get on edge. Uh, yes, it's legacy month, but there's not going to be an offering after this. But every one of us as people of God have to be, we have to ask ourselves the question, am I concerned enough to give something up? Am I concerned enough to give up some time? Am I concerned enough to at least pray? Am I concerned enough to give in a legacy that will help our community? Am I, is there something that I might need to give 
I, I like it this way. Sometimes in life, we have to give up in order to go up. A- anybody remember playing on the monkey bars? Anybody remember? Remember them dangerous playgrounds we used to have? <laughs> Slides that were like 800 feet tall? Yeah. M- remember monkey bars? Come on, where are you at? And, and, and you couldn't get to the next rung in the journey, watch this, unless you let go of your security. Ah. God was trying to preach to us way back there in kindergarten, everybody. Huh? We have to give up some things. Uh, see, Nehemiah, you got to understand the story. Nehemiah had it made. The exile was over. The people were going back, but he had a good job in a nice subdivision, making good money with a good position as a wine taster for the king. Mm, and all the perks that come with that. But he was willing to give up his position. Let me say it another way. He was willing to give up something temporarily that was comfortable for something eternal that wasn't as comfortable. Woo, come on now. Well, I'm losing the crowd, Mark. I mean, we started off everybody cheering. Now we're down to about a dozen. Here we go. Nehemiah 1.3, just to give you some backdrop, if you want to read this later. They said to me, those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble. How many know our world is in great trouble? Yeah. How many know no new president-elect is going to solve all the world? No new president is the savior, everybody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, and, and I'm not slamming. I'm just telling the truth. And the wall of Jerusalem is broken down. Society is broken. Sin came into our world and broke it down. And its gates have been burned with fire. He was concerned enough to give. You've got to ask yourself a question. How concerned am I? Number two, he was concerned enough to care. And this is what I mean about praying that my heart would break over the things that break God's heart. Because sometimes I drive through our little community and I get irritated by things I see. And I say, man, they should be doing X, Y, and Z. And and the officials ought to be doing. And the leaders ought to be doing. And the store owner ought to be doing. and and, And all of that thing. But eventually, as a child of God, my life is not my own. I have to be concerned enough somewhere in my life to care. (laughs) <laughs> Nehemiah 1.4, he says it this way. When I heard these things, I sat down and I wept. God, am I irritated or am I concerned? Am I mad about what's happened or am I concerned to the point that what breaks your heart breaks my heart? Do you know Jesus died for the people that irritate me? That's right. <laughs> you guys are looking at me like nobody ever irritates you. <laughs> but I can tell I'm irritating you right now. <laughs> Ask God to allow your heart to break over what breaks his. Number three is uh, Nehemiah was concerned enough to pray. Yes. Uh, and, and you can read that in that verse. I, I don't want to make this into a Bible study just on this. But number four is he was concerned enough to volunteer. In other words, he was willing to be part of the answer. He was willing to set his job on hold for a moment so that he could go and volunteer his time to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Wow, it's powerful, everybody. But here we go. He wasn't just concerned. What I love about the story of Nehemiah, he didn't just sit back in his nice cush job. He didn't just sit back in his nice church. He, he wasn't just concerned going, whew, I wish somebody would do something about that. I sure am sad about it. No, he picked up a hammer and went back to Jerusalem and started a construction project. So number one, he was concerned. Number two, just write down the word construction. I didn't have any fancy way of saying it. All right, everyone? But what this speaks of is we've got to move beyond concern and we've got to move into some construction. We got to, in other words, we got to be part of the answer, everybody. If we're waiting for somebody to show up, we're it. I like what the mayor said a few weeks ago. He said, if you're waiting for the government to be the answer to our community, you're going to be waiting a long time because the answer is not the government. The answer is the people of God. So let's roll up our sleeves and do it. Come on now. 
What I love about this, now this is the part that you can make personal, but it's also to us corporately. So let me preach these next points within the point to us as a church. Uh, um, and, and here's where Nehemiah started. When he started the construction project, he didn't just start with the walls. He went around and rebuilt all the gates that entered into the circle, if you would, into the city or into the family of God, if I could contextualize. He wanted to build all, he wanted to rebuild all the places of entrance. Ladies and gentlemen, we've got to be very concerned as a church about the gates that allow people to come into this thing called the family of God. We've got to keep them built. We've got to keep them protected. And if they've been destroyed, we've got to rebuild them for those uh, that have been those where the breach has uh, happened for many people. So I want you to lean into these. Number one, here's ten gates. I've got to go through them quick. I won't preach them. But, but I want you to know as a church, these are what we've got to do. We've got to rebuild and protect these things. Number one is the sheep gate. The first thing he did, and these are in order, the first thing he did was went and rebuilt the sheep gate. Now, the sheep gate speaks of sacrifice. How many know we don't have a message if we don't talk about and point toward the sacrifice of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? It's where we've got to start this message. And, and so this gate, it points towards Jesus' sacrifice. It's very interesting. This is trivial, but it's the only gate of the ten that doesn't have a lock. I, I, I like that. I, I nerd out on some of this. Excuse me for a minute just to be a geek. But it, it's because the door of salvation is always open. It's never locked. It's whosoever will at whatever time you will. Whenever you can't. Come on. The door is always open for us, everybody. And it, and it doesn't only speak of the sacrifice of Jesus, but it speaks of the sacrifice of the people of Jesus to get the walls rebuilt. Mm -hmm. Number two, he talks about the fish gate. And, and I'm glad Mark's here today because Mark and Susan hosted us, our staff, on a fishing trip. And I just thought this would be a good time to show our staff fishing. Come on, everybody, right there, huh? Yeah. Now, I want you to know that's some of our team. They went out and they caught fish. And I want you to know the more spiritual people aren't in that picture. I... <laughs> Missy and Carmen and me, we, we were back at the cabin praying and seeking God. How many believe that? Uh, well, I just thought it would be a time. Mark and Susan, it's good to have you guys home for a little bit. Thanks for all you're doing for hundreds of pastors, helping them have the energy to be fishers of men. Amen? Come on. The fish gate. It, it, it's, it, the, in this gate in the walls, it's literally where the fishermen brought the fish into the city brought nourishment, watch this, into the city. It's where they brought their catch. And what it reminds us, friends, is we can have church and church can have all kinds of styles, but at the end of the day, we are called to be fishers of men. I don't know why we have church if people aren't coming to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. We got to be fishers of men. Do you know in this church, just this year, out of these black chairs, over 200 people have made Jesus Christ their Lord and Savior this year, right here? Come on now. Documented cards. Do you know we've baptized 77 people in just two water baptisms this year? Isn't that great? That means we got like 120 something to go, all right? So, and by the way, if you want to be water baptized, uh, we're going to have another one before the year ends. Take a connection card and just check the box. Want to be water baptized? We'll email you. In fact, I think we're going to do it here in just a few weeks. But uh, I think we ought to hit 100 people being baptized this year. Wouldn't that be great? Last year, we ended on 98. Doggone it. Uh, I don't want that to happen. In fact, I'm just going to start dunking people that are close to the water baptism tank. I'm just... But if you're ready to take the next step, rebuild the fish gate in your life. Number three is the old gate. The old gate reminds us that the old message never changes, everybody. The old message. We can use new methods, but the message cannot change. And while I'm speaking about new methods, please listen to me. If you consider yourself in the young generation, we need you. And if the church has ever pushed you to the side and told you to wait and grow up and mature, I ask forgiveness because we need you. We need your ideas. We need your opinion. We need your input. We need your energy. Come on, everybody. And we need to know how to operate an iPhone. Come on and say a good amen. 
Number four is the valley gate. This gate speaks of our humility. We've got to keep humility in the body of Christ. we got to quit. I love what Janessa said last week. Just sometimes quit having the answers to everything. Sometimes just live in the wonder. Live in the faith. Live knowing I don't know what tomorrow is going to happen, but I know who holds tomorrow. It speaks of humility. We don't have to have every answer. We can point people to Jesus, everybody. And do you know how arrogant it is for Christians to act like they know everything? Calm down, you guys. We didn't come to church to start radius because we thought we'd be a better church. We just thought that we'd be an answer for some people that other churches weren't an answer for. So we thought we would put our angle on this good old-fashioned message of Jesus. Amen. Come on now. Number five, this is a weird gate. I'm glad I didn't get this assignment, is the dung gate. Some of you don't know what that word means. You use a different word there. But I'm trying to help you become holy, all right? This is where they put the trash from inside. They put the trash outside. How many know in our life there has to be a place where we examine the things that are inside that need to be put uh, 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 to the outside? We've constantly got to be evaluating what is good and what is best, what is here that doesn't need to be here. We constantly need to remove the rubbish of our life. The story is powerful. You can read it later. But Nehemiah, the people that were rebuilding the wall, the Bible says that their, their energy left them because they were stumbling over all the rubbish on the insides of the wall. It reminds me, years ago I did this message. Uh, in fact, I was really well known for this message. And this has been probably 30 years ago now. I was preaching this message on the book of Nehemiah. And, and I called the message, Removing the Rubbish. And when, when people walked into the auditorium that day, I had the whole stage destroyed. I mean, I had pieces of carpet ripped up. I had just garbage all over the place. I mean, no, that's not a very attractional church. And I mean, it was just piled. And people were walking in like, man, did the church get vandalized? What in the world? And right in the middle of it all, I had this burning barrel sitting right in the middle, all this garbage everywhere on the platform. And I preached a message entitled, Removing the Rubbish. And inside the burning barrel, what they didn't know is I had this little candle burning on the bottom. And I had this guy in my church that did uh, science shows for high schools. Matter of fact, he traveled with Bill Nye, the science guy. And uh, all right, wow, all right. I hope you cheer for Jesus like that. All right. And, and so what I would do is as I was preaching, I'd pick up garbage. And inside every garbage bag that I was putting garbage into, he already had a balloon in there filled with some kind of gas. Now, I'm not a scientist. I don't know what kind of gas. But it would look like as I'm preaching, removing the rubbish, and I would pack these bags, and I'd throw them over in the burning barrel. And there would be this mushroom flame that would pile out of the burning barrel. And the people were like, amen, woohoo! It was just great. Just kind of, do I need to have some fire up here to get an amen out of you guys? <laughs> As I was preaching that message one time, there was this very well-known evangelist in the crowd. He got fired up. He thought, man, that's one of the greatest messages I've ever seen. He said, do you mind if I use that message? I'm going to preach a revival services in Minneapolis, Minnesota. I said, man, it's yours. Take it. And he showed up to Minneapolis, but he didn't have Bill Nye the science guy with him. He knew there was supposed to be some kind of gas in the balloon. But he put the wrong kind of gas in the balloon. I wish we lived in the days of YouTube back then. It would be fun to look up what happened because he preached the message. He's preaching his heart out. He's packing the garbage bags. And the first bag he throws over into the burning barrel. And it literally blows up. The burning barrel hit the ceiling of the church. Blew the pastor off the stage into the front row. I mean, no, he had everybody's attention right there, huh? Now, if, he was, if that happened to me, the first thing I'd do is get up and say, and the Bible says, in the twinkling of an eye, the rapture, just like that. Uh, are you ready for Jesus? And then I'd give a salvation call. How many know I'd do that, right, everybody? Number six, the sixth gate that he, re he rebuilt was the fountain gate. It was the fountain gate. And the fountain gate, it speaks to us. By the way, have you ever noticed the order? Go back later and study the order of the gates. They're in chronological order. He first starts with salvation, the gate of salvation, the gate of purpose, the gate of humility, the gate of cleansing, 
the gate, this next one, the fountain gate, the gate of refreshing. How many know it's great that we're saved? But how many know we got to stay refreshed in God? Amen. Don't, Paul says to Timothy, don't be lacking in zeal. Let's not be lacking to be excited about the things that God is excited about. At this gate, there was this natural spring at this gate, and I could geek out on all of that. But here's what it says to me, that we have to make sure there's a fountain gate at Radius. A fountain gate is a life-giving place. It's where there's this natural spring. It gives life. It gives refreshment. Come on, you don't need to come to a church and get more guilt and more condemnation. You need to come to a place that builds you up and gives you life. Can I have an amen on that? Right, everyone? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes. He, so, uh, oops, I, I turned the wrong page here. I better get back. I got so excited. Number seven was the water gate. <laughs> Not that water gate. But anyway. <laughs> I just thought I'd see if you guys were paying attention. I thought it was kind of appropriate for this week. Anyway, the water gate, though, is symbolic of the word of God. uh, Here's what's interesting. Another little geek out moment. They didn't have to rebuild this gate. This gate was still intact. The walls up to this gate they had to rebuild, which reminds me what the word of God says, that heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word, come on shall remain forever. Ladies and gentlemen, we have got to be a church no matter what our style is. It can never, our style can never dictate the word of God. We've got to be people of the word of God. People need the life-changing word of God. Can I get an amen on that? Yeah, yeah. It reminds us to preach the word of God. When I say the word of God, I don't just mean the word of God. I mean the message of the gospel. There's a lot of churches preaching a lot of religious things. But at the end of the day, we got to preach grace. We got to preach the gospel. We got to preach that it's no longer about what we do to get to Him, it's about what He did to get to us. We got to preach this message. Come on, everyone. Number eight is the, the horse gate. They had a gate where they would bring the horses in. Matter of fact, if you study this out, Solomon would import uh, horses from Egypt to Jerusalem. Here's some other interesting, trivial things. But whenever you see donkeys in the scripture, donkeys are symbolic of peace. Remember, Jesus rode in on a donkey, a king of peace. But horses speak of warfare. Now, I know when Christians start talking about warfare, it can get kind of weird. uh, But there will always be a war. There will always be, if you're going to reach capacity, there will always be a battle to do it. You will never accidentally do anything great. Let me tell you, in order for, to see what's happening at Radius, let me tell you, how many know behind the scenes there had to be some battles? There had to be some warfare. There had to be some fights. All hell does not want what's happening right here. Some of you had to fight every devil in hell just to show up here today. Can I get an amen in this house today? Right? There will always be a warfare, and it speaks that the people of God got to fight. Let me say it another way that's not so preachy. You know you're on the road to success because it's uphill all the way. You don't ever accidentally get to somewhere good. You don't accidentally have a good marriage. You don't accidentally raise godly kids. You don't accidentally have uh, your soul in health. You don't accidentally get off drugs. You don't accidentally do anything that is good. There was a battle. There was a battle. Mm. And so Christians, I would just say, it's, we got to fight. We got to have some fight. We got to fight for some underdogs. We got to fight for some good things. Yeah. Number nine. Number nine is the east gate. The east gate is the gate where Ezekiel had a vision of the glory of God returning. And here's what's interesting. Jesus came through the east gate on his triumphal entry. But this gate reminds me, and it reminds us that no matter what we do, we've got to lift up the name of Jesus. I say it pretty often, maybe not often enough, but I'll get up here and one of the first things I'll say is sit down your coffee and your notepads and let's be reminded that today is all about Jesus. Looks like I need to preach that more. All right, let's try it again. Today is all about Jesus. And 
And I ask you to give the Lord a good hand clap because it's not about me. It's not even about you. It's all about Jesus first. And when we lift him up, then we can talk about all the needs that you and I have. Amen, everyone? So let's lift Jesus up. His glory, his grace. The tenth gate, and I'm almost out of your way, is the inspection gate. And the inspection gate is where they would bring the troops, where they would bring the armies, where they were brought to be inspected. And it reminds me, watch this. It reminds me to live as though one day I'll stand before God and be inspected. Did I meet, did I reach my capacity? Did I do, was I faithful what, what he called me to? Did he give me life and did I take my life and bring it back to him? One day I'll stand before him. Wow. And you know what I want to hear? The same thing you want to hear. Well done. Good. And sometimes faithful dude. No, well done, good and faithful servant. Amen, everybody? But not only was he willing to do construction, it goes a little bit deeper. You guys still with me? It goes a little deeper, and he was willing to have some conflict. He first starts with concern. Notice how it just kind of, we always talk about keeping you on the journey. Oh, it's nice starting out on the journey just with some concern. But then we're going to push on you a little bit until you roll up your sleeves and get in the construction. And then if we're going to keep on the journey, eventually we're going to have to turn the construction into some conflict. And here's the problem with Christians. If we're not fight, we're created to fight. Has anybody noticed this? Come on, married folks. Where are you at? We're created to fight. And the problem is when we lose sight of what we're supposed to be fighting for, we'll fight with one another. We'll fight in the church. We'll fight about all kinds of things because we've lost what we ought to be fighting for. Mm -hmm. And and so there's conflict. Let me say it another way. Nehemiah was constantly being called to come down off the wall and stop doing the best thing to settle for some good things. Uh And it was a constant conflict. And I realize right now that I'm getting ready to preach a little bit of preacher hyperbole where I live in this bubble and, and, and I don't understand where everybody else lives. I do. There will always be some conflict. The, 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 the tension is real between, okay, I've got to go make a living. I've got to take the kids to soccer and gymnastic and piano and all of the stuff that, re, that is required by life. But the, the, but the tension or the battle or the conflict is always all of the things of the world calling us down from the eternal things of God. And if we're going to reach capacity, we're going to have to face that conflict of what matters right now, which is important. I'm not minimizing it. But what we do right now for this world, there has to be some involvement on the parts of people of God on what matters for the next world to come. There has to be. Nehemiah 6, 1 through 3, I love this. When the word of God came to Sambalad, Tobiah, Geshem, the Arab, and the rest of our enemies, that I had rebuilt the wall and not a gap was left in it, though up to that time I had set the doors and the gates. Watch this, Sanballat and Geshem sent me this message. Come, let us meet together in, the, uh, in one of the villages on the plains of Ono. But they were scheming to harm me. Let me stop right there. There will always be something calling you down off of your work. There will always be something calling you down off what's most important to do something. There will always be something calling you down from what you're doing for eternal value to do something that has temporary value. And I know we got to pay attention to that because we all got to eat. I get it. But if you come down off the wall every time, we will never have that marriage that we hope for. We will never raise those kids we're hoping to raise. We'll never meet our capacity. Watch how he answers them. I love this. So I sent a messenger to them with this reply. I am carrying on a great project, and I cannot go down. I like how the King James says, excuse me, I'm old school today. He says, in the King James, it says, I cannot come down to the likes of you. (laughs) I think every once in a while we need to point at all of the stuff we get involved in. 
and saying, I'm doing something that has eternal value, and I cannot come down to the likes of you. Well, I got to move on. All right. Um, that's the conflict. Uh, the conflict. How many know there's a lot of good things that I and you need to say no to so that we can say yes to the most important things? That's what capacity is about. That's what legacy is about. You know, I can sacrifice a month of coffees just to participate in something. Amen. That's good. Thank you very much. <laughs> Let me get to the last point. The last point is you already know it. You're way ahead of me. Not only did he have concern, not only was he involved in the construction, not only did that turn into conflict, but that led Nehemiah to fill in his capacity. Right. Now let me just talk for two more minutes on this. The subject of capacity. If I was just sitting having coffee with you, the pastor part of me would start overflowing. If you were asking me things like, what's the vision for Radius, you, you would need two or three hours because I could ramble all day about what I believe God is calling us to do. And, and you guys might think I'm just patronizing you when I say, I think we've just started. If you know anything about me, ask those, ask those closest to me, my family, my team. What, it, 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 this is what I live for because I believe that all we've done for the last few years is build a foundation. And God has not brought us as a church this far to say, okay, have good Sunday services. Amen. No, no, maybe he raised us up because there needs to be some more light in this community that will affect your children and your children's children. And their ch come on, somebody, right? And so if we were just sitting here and I was talking about capacity, I would start rambling about some things like this. And, 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 and now you can humor me for just a minute. I would say some things like, well, you know, Though our seating capacity is maxed, our reach to our community is not maxed. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're in three services right now, and, and for the most part, the seating capacity is maxed. But I'll tell you what we're going to do. Our reach is not maxed. In other words, what that means is our reach is bigger than our, our reach capacity is bigger than our seat capacity. Right. So, so I would start talking about, well, we're going to add a fourth service, and, 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 and don't worry about me, what God calls us to do, He empowers us to do. And, and so we'll, we'll probably do another service. It probably won't be on Sunday, but it'll probably be during the week so that we could reach capacity, come on now, of all those people that work a job on Saturday and Sunday. Come on now. And I know it's out of the box, but if you're going to reach capacity, you've got to think out of the box. Right. How many know God doesn't just show up to this place on Sunday morning? If we meet together and where two or three are gathered, he can show up here on a Thursday night. Come on, somebody. Right? Yeah, yeah. And, 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 I would, and, and watch this. Let me say this. I know I'm out of time, but watch this. Somebody asked me a couple weeks ago, they gave me a pastor appreciation card, and it was so sweet. And, and, and then they asked me this question. For those of you that don't know, there's a day in the month of October that's called Pastor appreciation day and they gave me a card and and they said pastor how come we don't celebrate pastor appreciation day around here and i said because it's real simple it's because this thing that god is doing is not about me and if we stopped to have a pastor appreciation day then we'd have to have stop and have a pass or we'd have to have a gym appreciation day and we'd have to have a Mark Appreciation Day. And we'd have to have a, a, a Lynn Appreciation Day. And a, a Mary Appreciation Day. Because it's not about me. It's about all of us. Now watch this. I mean this with all my heart. I was grown up in a denomination. They would stop and take the one Sunday in October. They'd take up a special love offering for the pastor. And while it's nice and while it's generous, I would rather bypass some kind of financial blessing coming to me and do something called a legacy offering where it's not about me but it's about the city and the community that we live in. Come on now. Now, hold on. I am not criticizing any church that does Pastor Appreciation Day. Please don't say what I'm not saying. I'm just saying there's something bigger than me at play here. There's a community and there is a legacy that God has called us to live. And there's a capacity that he's called us to fulfill. Come on, somebody, right? 
So here's some of the things as we're talking about legacy offering. I don't know if some of you know this, but Christ the King, they're moving over to the mall. So we've been talking about buying their building so we can remodel and double our capacity, everybody. And, and we can have a bigger piece of pro- you know, We could build bigger barns for a bigger harvest. Some of you are nervous right now. That's why we can't have coffee. I'd freak you out. <laughs> And if we can't get that building, what's wrong with getting another building and expanding our reach uh, and raising up more leaders uh, and raising up more pastors? uh, What's wrong with that? Why is it okay for the world to think big? But we got to be careful not to get ahead of God. I learned last week he only walks three miles an hour. Huh? We've made an offer. We want to buy that Elks building. They don't want to sell it to us yet, but I think if God wants us to have it, we might get it. Because we need more parking, and we need a youth mall, and we need a recovery center. What would it look like? We're getting ready to, with the legacy offering, tear apart our kitchen. And I know it's a bummer. We got this commercial kitchen. Uh, but let me tell you, I would rather house more kids than more hamburgers. Come on, somebody. What if we had a school of ministry where we started raising up pastors, young men and women? What if we had Finding Freedom Wellness Center where it was happening seven days a week, every day of the week for a community that desperately needs it? Can somebody dream to capacity? And by the way, i got to close. I'm way over time. But when you're considering your legacy offering this year, those of you that are business owners, can I just put a little nugget to chew on? Consider your business being a part of legacy. I met with a business owner this week. He said the greatest thing he's done in his business is to allow his business to be a part of legacy because even through the lean times, God blessed him. Now, I don't say that to you to manipulate you. I'm just repeating what was told to me. Mm -hmm. Amen? Our community, I got to close, so here it is. Our community desperately needs some people who will be repairers of the breach. I leave you with these questions on the board. Number one, do you have concern for what concerns God? It's really easy for me to lose sight of that. Number two, are you willing to be part of the construction? Roll up your sleeves and be part of the solution. Number three, will you fight to keep an eternal perspective? And number four, are you reaching your capacity? i got to close right there. Will you receive that message today, everybody? Come on, man. Would you stand with me all over this place as I let you get going? i got to let you go, but if you're here today and you're not a follower of Jesus, I can tell you already you're not reaching capacity. You're just a shell of a being. And my life might be good, but I'm not talking about life being good. I'm talking about reaching capacity. And if you're here today and you're not a follower of Jesus, I want to give you that opportunity before we leave here today. And I know I spoke to the church today, but for whatever reason, God allowed you to come in and be part of the church because he loves you too much to leave you the way you are. Amen. And so with heads bowed and eyes closed all over this room, if you're here and you say, hey, Ken, would you remember me in the closing prayer? I don't know all that it means to be a Christian, but I want to become a Jesus follower. I want to reach the plans and purposes, the capacity that he has for my life. I'm realizing that it's not about what I do. It's about what he has already done. And I want to receive that gift of grace. And if that's you in this place, I won't call you forward this morning. But just in the closing prayer, you'd say, that's me. And you just slip your hand up all over this room and say, hey, don't close. Before I get an opportunity to become a follower of Jesus. All over this room, you slip up your hand. That's me today. That's me. That's me. That's me. All over this room. Yeah. Yep. God bless you. Yep. There you go. Thanks, guys. God bless you. God bless you. Yep. Thank you, guys, for helping me see. Yep. Yep. God bless you. Yeah, that's so good. Man, that's good. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Great move. Man, I think God brought you here just today to remind you he loves you. He has a plan for your life. Wow. Well, there's about a half a dozen hands up in the room, and we're going to pray this prayer. Now, when I get to amen, I'm going to dismiss us because we got another crowd coming. And I apologize ahead of time for the chaos. There will be people over at the cross that will pray with you if you want to pray. There will be a phone number on the screen that if you pray this prayer, you could text it, and we'll get with you before you leave the building. If you didn't bring your phone, just mark on the connection card. I committed my life to Christ, but all of heaven 
is celebrating over these yes. six today. Let's pray it together. Father God, Father God thank, you Jesus. thank you for Jesus. I'm a sinner. I'm a sinner. I, need a I need a Savior. Come into my life, into my life. and be my Lord. be my Lord. And from this day forward, this day forward. I'm going to walk with you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Come on, let's celebrate together, everybody. Amen. We sure do love you. Don't miss next Sunday. I think it's the best one in the series. God bless.